join me as we continue our Family Catechism series with a special novena of reflections on the precious blood of Jesus Christ, shown most vividly in the Holy Eucharist. For as often as you shall eat this bread and drink this chalice, you shall shew the death of the Lord until he come. Therefore, whosoever shall eat this bread or drink the chalice of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and of the blood of the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 26 to 29. How many labor unions would not even exist today? Or labor disputes over wage hike would easily be resolved if we have workers like St. Isidore. St. Isidore was a devout man. He would never begin his day without first hearing Mass receiving Holy Communion, and spending at least one hour on his knees in thanksgiving after the Mass. He worked for a wealthy landowner who made sure that he gets his money's worth. Because of Esidor's piety, other farm hands accused him of staying too long in the church and of always being late to work. His master went out to the farm early in one morning to check whether the accusation against Isidore was true, that he would arrive late, and he never finished anything. To his great astonishment, he saw Isidore, accompanied by two angels, dressed in white, flowing the fields with two yoke of oxen. From this time forward, Isidore was held in great veneration by the wealthy farmer, and by all who heard of the story. Sadly today, we see very few people go to Mass and even receive Holy Communion with love and reverence. Instead, it has become an ordinary sight to witness the desecration of the Holy Eucharist during the Holy Mass. He who eats of this bread and drinks of this chalice unworthily eats and drinks judgment to himself. What an expression! St. Paul is challenging us to receive the body and blood of Christ in a worthy manner, so that all the graces which Jesus intends to pour out to us during Holy Communion in order to divinize us will be properly channeled for our own benefits and for the good of the mystical body of Christ, the Church. The hurdle that God is giving us in return for the great graces we receive in Holy Communion is to receive Jesus, the King of Kings, in a right and worthy manner. Otherwise, a tough option is on the way for a just penalty that will penetrate our innermost being. How fair and just God will be if we do not accept His terrific challenge we eat and drink our own judgment. What kind of judgment do we eat and drink? A sentence of eternal damnation. A sentence of never-ending misfortune. However, when we receive the body and blood of Christ worthily, we shall receive eternal life with God and with Mother Mary and Saint Joseph and with all the angels and saints in beatific vision. In order to receive the abundant fruits of the Holy Eucharist, a certain cooperation is required on the part of the receiver. It is not that the efficacy of the sacrament depends at all on the recipient, 
but because its salutary effects in this particular case depends upon the disposition with which it is received. The cooperation which is required on our part consists in approaching it with a sincere desire to receive the graces which are imparted through it, and afterward in turning them carefully to account. In order to obtain this disposition, it is very important to devote some time before and after communion to preparation and thanksgiving. Let us consider these following steps to prepare worthily for Holy Communion. First, if we are aware of having committed a mortal sin, we must go to confession immediately. Otherwise, if we are already in the state of sanctifying grace, we should make a habitual effort to please God. Second, fast from food and drink for at least one hour before receiving Holy Communion. This will dispose us properly to receive in our heart Jesus our Savior. Third, spend at least 10 to 15 minutes before the Mass begins in silence. This position, disposing our mind and heart that we are going to receive our Creator and Savior. Faith in the real presence of God, sacrifice and banquet will enable us to properly worship Him with Latria. Fourth, receive Holy Communion at the communion rail, kneeling and on the tongue, for we are not receiving just a plain piece of bread, as the Protestants believe, but rather a supernatural being, where angels and saints revere with love and trembling on their knees. Fifth, after Holy Communion, kneel in your pew, and over thanksgiving for the greatest and richest graces we have received from God, who transform us into His image, where even angels would serve us in awe. St. Bernard expressed the same truth when he said, Sicut to Deo aparorucris, ita tibi Deus apiparevit, which means, God will exhibit Himself to you just as you show yourself disposed towards Him. When people complain of receiving little fruit from their communions, it is because they continue to ignore their own negligence. For as the light of the sun far exceeds the light of the moon, so do the effects of Holy Communion and the loving heart greatly surpass those which it produces in a tepid and slothful soul. There's nothing that gives more honor to God and contributes more to our own welfare than the devout reception of the Holy Eucharist. On the contrary, there's nothing more injurious to God and more hurtful to our souls than an unworthy communion. Perhaps you will ask yourself, are there really bad people so wicked as to knowingly and willfully make an unworthy communion? Out of pure malice, there are many people who receive Holy Communion in the state of mortal sin. This abuse is committed in three classes of people. First, by all those who go to Holy Communion after having been refused absolution. Second, by all those who have willfully concealed a mortal sin in confession. And third, by those who, though they had confessed all their mortal sins, have nevertheless no true sorrow for them and no firm purpose of amendment. To the latter class belong all those who do not intend to keep the promises they made in confession, those who are not willing to be reconciled to those who have offended them, those who will not restore the property or good name of their neighbors, those who are not fully determined to keep away from the occasion of sins, and finally, all those that will not break off sinful and dangerous company. The Holy Eucharist is a pledge of love. In Holy Communion, God lovingly caresses the soul. When St. John reposed on our Lord's bosom, he did not enjoy as much familiarity with Him as does the soul that receives Him in Holy Communion. We call it communion because it is a union between the soul and God. How horrible it is 
to abuse this holy sacrament, to receive it with a traitor's heart. How horrible a crime it would be in the eyes of the Catholic word to kill a priest or bishop at the altar or the Pope upon his throne. Justice would require that such a criminal should be punished with much greater severity than the ordinary murderer. How do we feel at knowing that Jesus is being murdered right on the altar with all these sacrilegious communions committed every day? It is terrible to think that there are Catholics who keep the sacred host up to receiving communion in their hand and sell the sacred host for at least $500 to, to Satanists who use it during the Satanic Masses. There are Catholic students in Catholic schools who spit on the sacred host outside the chapel because they do not like the taste, and then the priests refuse to pick up the host from the floor because it has been soiled. There are Catholics who receive Holy Communion every Sunday after having voted to legalize abortion and same-sex marriage, not to mention those who are living a sinful lifestyle, and nobody even cares to tell them that they should not receive Holy Communion. Even politicians who support total birth control, abortion, sterilization, euthanasia, and same-sex marriage are seen receiving Holy Communion without any qualm of conscience. Think of how grievous then must have been the crime of those who persecuted our Lord Himself. Let us read the simple words of Isaiah 53, 1-8. He was despised and the most abject of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with infirmity. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter he was mute as a lamb before his shearers, and he opened not his mouth. He gave his cheek to the striker, and he was filled with reproaches. He was made a derision to the people, and their song all the day long. He was cut off from the land of the living. The following event was related to me by a Redemptorist father, in whose native country the event took place. In the year 1828 or 1829, a young man traveled through Switzerland. When he came to Zurich, he fell dangerously ill. Being a Catholic, he begged the hotel keeper to send for a Catholic priest. I'll send for one, said the hotel keeper. Meanwhile, the hotel keeper agreed with two other guests of his to play the priest with two servers. Accordingly, this hotel guest went to the sick man and heard his confession, after which he received from the sick man some money as a little present with the request to say three masses. After this criminal action, the hotel guest left the sick man, went with the other companions into another room, saying to them, come, let us go and say the three masses, meaning that they would drink three bottles of wine. They sat down at a table and having emptied one bottle said, Behold, one mass already said. Having emptied the second bottle, they cried out with great laughter, Now two masses are said. God did not long withhold his justice. No sooner had they drunk the third bottle of wine when all three of them suddenly died turning as black as coal. This dreadful event became known among the people. The civil magistrates interfered, and they locked up the room, leaving the three black corpses inside for the space of 26 days in order to make a minute examination of the case. This is a well-known fact in that city and in the neighboring provinces. John Paul II in Domenici Cene in 1980, number 11, confirms this abuse. Sometimes indeed, quite frequently, everybody participating in the Eucharistic Assembly goes to communion. And in some such cases, as experienced pastors confirm, there has not been due care to approach the sacrament of penance so as to purify one's conscience. 
This can of course mean that those approaching the Lord's table should find nothing on their conscience to keep them from the sublime and joyful act of being sacramentally united with Christ. But there can also be another idea that the Mass is only a banquet in which one shares by receiving the body of Christ in order to manifest above all else fraternal communion. It is not hard to add to these reasons a certain human respect and mere conformity. Let us take the example of Balthasar, who laid his profane hands upon the sacred vessels, and there suddenly appeared upon the opposite wall the fingers of a man's hands tracing a few words in which the sacrilegious monarchs read his own death sentence. Antiochus plundered the temple of Jerusalem, and the avenging hand of God stretched him upon the bed of agonizing pain, where he died of a loathsome disease. Such were the chastisement of the Almighty in the old law. What then will be the punishment of him who dishonors not the Ark of the Covenant, but the very body of Jesus, he who raises to his polluted lips the holy vessels and receives into his sinful heart the thrice holy God himself, who draws the Lord of hosts from his sanctuary to place him side by side with Satan in his heart, who becomes guilty of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. In Holy Communion, Jesus gives himself to us and becomes ours, all ours, in his body, blood, soul, and divinity. St. Gemma Galgani said candidly to Jesus, I am your master. With communion, Jesus enters our heart and remains corporally present in us as long as the appearance of bread lasts, that is for about 15 minutes. During this time, the Holy Father states that the angels surround us to continue to adore Jesus and love Him without interruption. As St. Bernard wrote, when Jesus is corporally present within us, the angels surround us as a guard of love. We might not think enough of the sublimity of every Holy Communion, and yet St. Pius X said that if the angels could envy, they would envy us for Holy Communion. St. Madeline Sophie Barat defines Holy Communion as paradise on earth. St. Gemma Galgani one time was put to the test by a confessor who forbade her to receive Holy Communion. She wrote to her spiritual director, Oh, Father, Father, today I went to confession and the confessor has said that I must stop receiving Jesus. Oh, my Father, my pen does not want to write more. My hand shakes strongly. I cry. Dear Saint, truly a seraphim, all on fire for the love of the Eucharistic Jesus. Similarly, St. Gerald Mahalia, for a false and slanderous report from which he did not wish to defend himself, was punished by being deprived of Holy Communion. The suffering of the saint was so great that one day he refused to go to serve Holy Mass for a priest who was visiting because he said, on seeing Jesus in the host, in the hands of the priest, I would not be able to resist taking by force the host from his hands. What longing consumed this wonderful saint. And what a rebuke for us who perhaps are able to receive Holy Communion daily with ease, and we do not do it. It is a sign that we lack the essential, love. And perhaps we are so in love with earthly pleasures that we can no longer appreciate the heavenly delights of union with Jesus in the house. Child, how can you feel the fragrance of paradise which diffuses itself from the tabernacle as St. Philip? of a young man in love with the pleasures of the flesh, of dances and amusements. The joys of the Eucharist and the satisfaction of the senses are opposed to each other, as we read in Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. And the sensual man perceives not these things which are of the Spirit of God, which we find in 1 Corinthians 2, 14. This is wisdom which comes from God, and for this reason, there is a need for purity of soul to receive communion. 
St. John Baptist de la Salle said, Approach the sacred banquet with the same disposition that you would desire to have to enter heaven. One should not have less respect in receiving than in being received by Him. There's a need of having recourse with great care to the cleansing of confession. Saint Padre Pio of Petrocina used to repeat with trepidation to his brethren, God sustains even in the angels, what must he see in me? For this reason he was very diligent in making his sacramental confessions daily before the Mass. So too did Saint Teresa of Jesus, when she was aware of having committed the least venial sin, she would never receive Holy Communion without first going to confession. She therefore went to confession every day. The Catechist of the Catholic Church 1455 says, Without being strictly necessary, confession of everyday faults, venial sins, is nevertheless strongly recommended by the Church. Indeed, the regular confession of our venial sins helps us form our conscience, fight against evil tendencies, let ourselves be healed by Christ, and progress in a life of the Spirit. By receiving more frequently through the sacrament the gifts of God's mercy, we are spurred to be merciful as He is merciful. For these reasons, we understand why these saints go to confession every day to receive Holy Communion worthily and benefit much from it, not because they were scrupulous, but because they had a delicate conscience. Saint Mary Magdalene de Pachi, Saint John Paul II, Saint John the Twenty Third, Saint Hugh, Saint Thomas Aquinas, Saint Francis de Sales, Saint Ignatius Loyola, Saint Charles Borromeo, Saint Francis Borgia, Saint Louis de Bertrand, Saint Joseph Cupertino, Saint Leonard of Port Morris, and many others, including Venerable Father John Harnon, would all go to confession daily. When it comes to something so precious as this, let us take to heart the Holy Spirit's admonition. Let not your share of desired good pass you by, as we read in Ecclesiasticus 14.14. 14. Are we not perhaps acting contrary to the example of the saints when we regard our period of thanksgiving as too long and perhaps feel impatient to get it over with? How carefully we should watch ourselves here. And if it is true that at every communion Jesus gives us a hundredfold for the hospitality we show Him, as Saint Teresa of Jesus declared, then it is likewise true that we must answer a hundredfold for neglecting His hospitality. A fellow Capuchin of Saint Pio de Petrelcina related how one day he went to confession to the saint, and among other things confessed, omitting his thanksgiving after Holy Mass, because some ministry made him unable. While Padre Pio was lenient in judging the other faults, when he heard him confess this omission, he grew more serious, and with a stern look said firmly, Let us see to it that our being unable is not just being unwilling, I always have to make my thanksgiving, otherwise I will pay dearly. We may remember the example of St. Philip Neri, who had two altar boys with lighted candles, went to accompany a man who had left the church immediately after receiving Holy Communion. What a beautiful lesson! For the sake of good manners, if for no other reason, when a person receives a guest, he pauses to give his attention to him and takes interest in him. If this guest is Jesus, then we will only have reason to be sorry that his bodily presence with us is scarcely last 15 minutes or a little more. Saint Francis of Assisi, Saint Giuliana Pocolieri, Saint Catherine, Saint Pascal, Saint Veronica, St. Joseph of Copertino, St. Gemma, and many others, 
used to almost always go into the loving ecstasy immediately after Holy Communion. As for the duration, only the angels measured the time. Also, St. Teresa of Babila nearly always went into ecstasy right after receiving Holy Communion. And sometimes it was necessary to carry her away bodily from the communion rail. Luther, King of Lorraine, conceived a great dislike towards his lawful queen. His eyes fell upon a beautiful young maid of honor of his court, named Waldrada, and his heart followed his eyes. The Pope was informed of this scandal, and he commanded Luther to quit his paramour and to take back his lawful wife. He threatened to excommunicate the wicked king in case of refusal. Luther made a thousand false promises. He even went to Rome in order to be absolved from the ban he had incurred. He requested the Pope to reconcile him solemnly during Mass, and he wished to receive Holy Communion from the hands of the Pope himself. The Pope took the most prudent measures to find out the sincerity of the king's intention, but all to no purpose. He then celebrated Mass. The king, with many of the nobles of his court, was present. The time of communion came, and the king, with his nobles, went to the altar rail to receive communion. The Pope then turned to the monarchs, and holding the sacred hose in his hand, said in a loud and distinct voice, O King, if you are sincerely resolved to quit Waldrada and to take back your lawful wife, then receive the Holy Sacrament unto life everlasting. But if you are not sincerely resolved, then do not dare to profane the sacred body of Jesus Christ and eat your own condemnation. Luther turned pale and trembled, but he had already made a sacrilegious confession, and now he sealed his doom by adding a sacrilegious communion. The Pope turned then to the noble men who were kneeling beside their king and said to them, If you have taken no part in the crime of your king, then may the body of our Lord Jesus Christ be to you a pledge of eternal salvation. Some of the noble men were terrified and left the altar rail without receiving. But the greater part of them followed the example of their king. They had committed a fearful crime, and the punishment of God was swift and terrible. The king and his court immediately left Rome. They had no sooner arrived at the city of Lucca than they were attacked by the most malignant fever, in consequence of which they lost their speech. They were tormented by an inward fire, and their nails, hair, and skin fell off, while on the other hand, the lives of those of the king's court who left the communion rail before receiving were spared, so that the vengeance of heaven was quite evident. What now will happen to those who divorce and remarry? And what will happen now in Germany when Protestant spouses of Catholics are given freely Holy Communion, although it's denied by the CDF? Even though they are heretics and do not believe in the real presence, transubstantiation, and sacrificial aspect of the Holy Eucharist. Let us always remain in the state of grace by remaining faithful to the will of God as Mary did, so that we can receive Holy Communion every day to guarantee our salvation, fervor, and perseverance in faith until death. Let us devote another hour before the exposed Blessed Sacrament daily to adore Jesus and to thank Him for all the graces we have received. Let us pray. O oh, loving Virgin, I am about to receive your Jesus. I wish my heart were like yours when you became the mother of the Savior at the time of the Annunciation of the Angel. O oh, Jesus, I believe that you are really present in the Blessed Sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you spiritually in my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you, and I unite myself as if you're already there, or never permit me 
to be separated from you. This we ask to the most powerful intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary and the most chaste heart of Saint Joseph in the name of the Sacred Heart of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.